I'm Eric, and this is a PIO vlog. Aerial, medic, respond. Hi everyone, welcome back to another vlog. It's so great that you're all here watching and I wish one of the PIOs could be joining you in the live chat tonight for the premiere, but Connor and I are both busy working on a special project tonight and we can't be here for the live chat. It's something we've been planning for quite a while now and something we've been working on actually all week this week. I can't tell you what it is, but it'll be a great vlog when we're able to show you and you'll be able to enjoy someone else's vlog who's working on this project as well. But in the meantime, I'd like to bring you up to speed on what's been happening around South Metro. Those of you who follow South Metro on our social media accounts, or even some of you who may have just been watching the local or national news, may have seen a mid-air collision between two aircraft in South Metro's fire district earlier this week, and I'd like to talk about that response and exactly what happened. Divided by mid-air collision. QM 970, declare an emergency. No souls were lost, just damaged aircraft. Three people are lucky to be alive after two planes hit each other over Colorado. Four five, we just had a, uh, a Cirrus go down uh, about a mile south of Tree Creek Reservoir. He had uh, his parachute out. He's in the residential area. Um, from the tower perspective, see it about the two mile final uh, for one seven left went down to the residential area and he also uh we have a keelum exiting one seven left and it appears that he might have hit him red one red two engine 44 engine 31 engine 42 medic 44 medic 42 district one battalion g5 Safety 35, Air Alert 3 Aircraft Emergency, Map Page U31A at Centennial Airport, 7800 South Peoria Street. On scene, we do have one plane that's down in the field. We've got no fire. I'll take Cherry Creek Command. We'll keep all units responsible. This was a very unique incident in many ways, and it's important to first understand exactly how air traffic works at Centennial Airport. So, for these two aircraft that were on the north side of the airport and planning on landing from the north to the south, there are two parallel runways at Centennial Airport. The easternmost runway on this approach is runway 17 left, and the westernmost runway is runway 17 right. The runways are far enough apart from each other that two aircraft are able to land simultaneously on both of those. When these particular aircraft were lining up for their approach to land, an accident occurred just at about 6,100 feet in elevation where one aircraft struck the other one and caused a lot of damage. Debris rained down to the ground, and one of the aircraft was unable to gain control. That aircraft is a Cirrus, which is equipped with a parachute. The pilot was able to deploy the parachute, which slowed the aircraft's descent, and it was much more of a controlled crash than a plane that doesn't have a parachute. That airplane went down in an open field along a jogging path, which is in the Cherry Creek State Park property, and thankfully, both of the people in that plane were not injured in this very violent landing that occurred. They were able to self-extricate from the aircraft and were just fine. South Metro's aircraft rescue and firefighting team still responded to verify not only that they were okay and didn't need to be rescued from the aircraft, but also to verify that the aircraft was secured, meaning that the fuel was shut off, the engine was shut down, no fuel was leaking, and that there wasn't a fire hazard. 
once all of those things are established by the fire department, there's not a lot of immediate work that needs to be done. But since South Metro had so many personnel on scene and the debris that fell down was scattered across a pretty large area, the incident dispatch team got special permission from the FAA in Washington, D.C. to fly their UAVs under the Centennial Airport air traffic and get a good look at where that debris fell and helped map out the scene. Personnel on the ground from South Metro, from Cherry Creek State Park, Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office, and Arapahoe Rescue Patrol marked that debris so that it would be easier for investigators from the FAA and the NTSB to find and archive when they got on scene to document the incident. I'm standing roughly in the middle of the debris field underneath where the mid-air collision occurred and we're on the Cherry Creek State Park property. The debris field is pretty expansive. Behind me over my shoulder here you can see where some of the vehicles are parked. Um, that's where the one aircraft came down, the Cirrus came down with its parachute deployed. And in front of me on the other side of the road uh, across Bellevue Avenue is where crews are also finding debris and marking that for the NTSB. Where the safety officer truck is parked is Bellevue Avenue, and you can see personnel there and uh, inside of the other portion of Cherry Creek State Park marking debris that they're finding for the investigation. Here's one of the largest and most identifiable pieces of debris, again, pretty far away from where the Cirrus landed. And as I pan up, you can see where it's laying. Once all of those pieces were identified, South Metro left the scene. The sheriff's office remained on scene to provide perimeter control because it's treated as an accident investigation. The NTSB and FAA spent the day out there gathering the facts that they needed to. Then the plane was loaded onto a flatbed trailer and transported to a hangar at the airport where the investigation can continue. There's lots of information that's available out there that has more specifics for those of you in the aviator community. This is a fire PIO vlog, so we're keeping it pretty basic as far as terminology and how everything works, but you can find more information and all of the detailed radio traffic and the radar at a video that I'll link in this description. What's up guys, I am here at Fleet and as some of you may already know, we just took delivery of the brand new Collapse 45 and I caught up with engineer Kevin Dickhausen to give us a quick look at this. We'll do a full in-depth Fleet Friday with Station 45 as soon as it gets outfitted with all of its equipment and goes in service. Hi, I'm Kevin and this is gonna be the introduction to the new Collapse truck and trailer. I'm actually gonna be uh, be a, one of the instructors for driving a truck and trailer since we don't have a lot of truck and trailers here at South Metro. This is a Freightliner. It's a commercial chassis. It's pretty much just a kind of a plain Jane truck, but it has a single axle. We actually went to the company Hackney for the, uh, the trailer, and they're the ones who developed the compartment system and the locking system and uh, the trailer that we are going to put all of our collapse stuff in. And what it, it's going to be pretty much revolutionary for collapse as taking equipment to the scene and being able to have everything we need to be efficient at our job. It's uh, actually 55 foot 6 inches long. The longer it gets, the harder it is to drive and uh, you want to trim that down. This isn't going to be something that goes alone all the time. It's going to be an asset for the state. And we were lucky enough to get take delivery on this truck so we could have this in our arsenal to help do uh, trench rescue or trench rescue and other collapses. But like I said, this is just a plain Jane commercial chassis um, made by Freightliner. But it does have a lot of uh, you know, unique things like you wouldn't find on a, a commercial truck, like the walkover and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, it does have uh, some other things that help charge this truck for electricity. So it's not going to have a generator on it currently. It's just powered by 12 volt and uh, batteries and the shoreline. So up here on the trailer, we have a lock system. Currently the doors are open, but on this, if you would close this, which it won't close right now, all of the doors will be locked at one time, so you don't have to unlock each individual door. So on this 
we're gonna have have a lot of uh, electrical stuff for like recharging batteries and anything else that you need to have charged. Uh, cameras, phones, that kind of stuff. This does have a lot of unique features. Uh, you have this ramp here. This ramp is for the Stanley tool. Currently this is, is not in uh, service to uh, do a lot of work yet because we have to do a lot of different applications in here. They're gonna put a winch so you can drag the Stanley tool up without having a whole lot of uh, people getting in the way to, to move that heavy tool. And then all of the tools that'll go along with it. It has some uh, tool racks. There's another one on the other side, two, both of these tool racks, so you can mount axes, uh, sledgehammers, that kind of thing. Anything you want to have that you're going to need on scene, and it's going to be readily available. We've got these really nice steps. These steps are going to help people get up into the higher compartments. It's going to help everybody get uh, things down to where it's not going to get anybody hurt. And you'll be able to look in there. If you notice on here, it's going to have some uh, electrical cords. We, are a, we should be able to hook a generator up to this and power it and, uh, and then get electrical outlets off to it if that's how they're going to configure it. Like I said, I'm not part of the tech team. I'm just one of the driving instructors. Oh. So back here, here's, here's one of the biggest reasons they got this, this trailer, in my opinion. This has a lot of room for lumber. You can put up shoring material. You can have all of your wood braces, anything you're going to need to help keep a building from continuing to collapse or securing it after, your, after the, the scene is done. So it has a lot of lumber. It's, I don't know how long this is, about 15 to 20 feet in length. And that way you can get up in there and put in your long lumber. But you can get up on this uh, platform and unload lumber as you need it so people don't get hurt. You can see some of the compartments are shallow and some are really deep. This is one of the more shallow. And it's just a, another compartment to put more stuff in to do our job. That'll be another compartment, pretty much the same thing. It does have uh, some nice lighting in it though. See, this is a half and half. So your lumber compartment's here, your shelves are here, and then you have slide outs. And there's plenty of room for slide outs. But if you look in here, we have lights all over it. So end of the day, we're never gonna be just during the day. So end of the day, when it gets dark, we're gonna be able to see what we need to see. Again, here's one of the very unique ladders that they have on here. It's kind of nice, it hangs out here now. When you're done, fold it up and it's nice and compact and it sits right along the edge of the truck so it doesn't get caught on things and, and get wrecked. But as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a normal uh, beverage trailer. Just the inside has been changed but it has all the same characteristics as a truck and a trailer. It's got the dollies, the fifth wheel, and everything you would for a, a normal beverage trailer. So in here, it's not ready to go yet, but there'll be MDT, radios, flashlights, anything that the, the drivers are gonna need to, to do their job, and the tech rescue guys. things you really have to be cognizant about is your left and your right turns. Now this trailer, because of its length, trailers beautifully. I mean it is, you can take really tight turns, you can be in a left turn lane, and you can stay in the white lines without going aggressively outside and then having to come all the way back like the big, real big trucks do.
I'm going to kind of get on it a little bit, kind of show you that the, the team members that were developing this truck made some really good decisions in their gearing, and it comes off of the line. Now it's empty, so it'll come off the line fast, but when it's loaded, it will come off of the, the line aggressively to keep up with traffic and not to be in people's way. Now for a truck, that's that's a pretty good boost of power. Like I said, it's empty, but it still has some great power. Now this truck is gonna be governed off at 67 miles an hour, and that's for just for the safety of everyone around. So here's our double turn. And if you get too aggressive in this turn, you can impact the uh, traffic that's on your left-hand side. A lot of the people don't really understand and realize that trucks that drive with trailers have that blind spot or that, that cramp spot to where your trailer can encroach on their lane. They have no, they have no forgiveness when it comes to length because if that long vehicle doesn't fit in that space, you're going to have to make it fit and it has to crush into someone else's space. But since this trailer is at that really nice length, it has such a great turning radius. I can really make tight turns. We'll come up to a uh, roundabout and I'll show you how just how nicely it turns. It won't touch a curb, uh, won't get in anybody's way. It just turns so nicely. So we're going to go all the way around this roundabout and come back around and we'll head back to where we started. But I'll take the inside lane, which is the tightest lane, not touch a curb. Not even get close. And I'm not encroaching on the other lane. Not too bad. And uh, when I come out of it, come out of it unscathed. Pull my parking brake, trailer brake comes on automatically, and here we are. Had a good drive. Hey, how's it going? So uh, we're gonna be putting these uh, decals on the side of the topper here. Uh, this truck's brand new, just went in service yesterday, and uh, we didn't have these at the time, but now we do, so it's the last, uh, really the last step of it being fully finished, so. All right, so uh, this is uh, kind of an update of what I'm doing right now. Uh, right now I'm working on the new Med 1. Um, they're going from a uh, Ford Expedition, which was our old BC um, at Littleton Fire, um, to a F-150 police responder like all the other trucks. Uh, we're trying to keep them um, all the same so that we can uh, interchange them as needed in the future. So um, right now the, the pickup was basically all stock uh, two days ago. So I spent about two days of work on it. Um, and I'll kind of go front to back and kind of show uh, what all is going on right now. So it's, it's a mess, so bear with me. <laughs> so, 
So in the front here, we've uh, installed the uh, ProGuard push bar. Um, and then there's uh, four lights on it. And then there's two more lights inside the grill here. And so I'm working on running all the wires up to uh, these breakout boxes, which are right here. Um, and then there will be uh, some high beam wigwag um, bulbs. These are LED bulbs that we've put in um, so that the, the high beams will flash. Um, and then we'll pull the intake box out and install the nodes for the system under there um, and then finish the wiring. So the main harness is here and I've ran it through the firewall this morning. We have our uh, siren wires that go down to the sirens and then we have the uh, battery cables. Uh, we also installed these, uh, these are quick mounts, so they use 3M adhesive to stick on. So we only have to drill one hole in the, uh, the fender, which is unfortunate, but it's a lot better than three holes. So. Um, so yeah, right now I'm laying out the main harness for the, for the system. Um, and it is very messy, but what we have, this is a, called an ignition security system. So this is a momentary button that goes up here and that allows the uh, driver to remove the key while the engine's running and they can lock the door, go on scene, whatever they're doing and leave the engine running and not have it stolen. So, um, and then there's, uh, there's what's called a blue link module, which is this guy here. So this is how we get the inputs from the vehicle side. So this interfaces with the OBD2 connector and we can get any kind of input we need as far as doors open, vehicle speed, anything like that to control the lighting and siren. Um, we can also control, for instance, the fan we have in the back compartment um, based on vehicle speed, if it's in park or reverse, things like that. Um, so here's the, this is the control panel we use. Um, this system is made by Sound Off Signal, um, this particular one. So this is just kind of a rough layout to get everything where it needs to be. And then back here, this is where our box will be installed. Um, well, I'm laying out the, the system for the emergency lighting. So this is the central controller here. And this is the brains, basically the brains of the lighting and siren system. And then this is the siren amplifier. And then each of these little boxes are nodes or breakout boxes, I'm sorry, um, for each light bar. So we have the, the 54 inch light bar up top and then a traffic advisor in the back. And so that's where we get um, access to that. So, and then I install a, a fuse panel here for all of our ancillary wiring and lighting that we add on to the back as well as GPS and things like that. All right, so uh, one of the first things we do um, when we're building one of these trucks is we have to drop the headliner down and uh, remove a lot of paneling and stuff so we can install all these antennas and the light bar. Um, so that involves drilling six holes, six large holes in the roof. So um, back here we have the two 800 radio antennas. This tall whip is for the VHF. This is for the GPS Opticom, and then this uh, coffin-shaped antenna here is the tri-band antenna for the mobile data computer. Um, and then we have the factory Ford antenna over there that we don't mess with. But. And then we also have a solar panel here that we'll install. This is a 175 watt panel, barely fits on the topper. Um, it's the biggest we can, we can get at the moment. So uh, that's just some of the stuff that gets installed up here. So here's some more of our quick mounts that we've installed. Um, back here, we have to drill a very large hole for the auto eject system, which is here. So this allows the driver to get in and start the truck, and this will automatically eject the 110 volt plug from the wall so that they don't drive away with it. And then this is our inverter charger that plugs into it. This is uh, basically what maintains the power um, as we need it. We have 110 volt uh, whenever we need it um, for charging batteries, etc. And then it also 
can charge um, both 12 volt batteries about 60 amps. So, um, these are just some of the other components I have laid out. Uh, these are the nodes that are for the system. I'm going to have a few more lights, um, things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's coming along, but I uh, got a little bit to go. So probably about 10 hours into it and uh, maybe 80 or 90 to go. So thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Now it's time for the mail call and we got lots of great things to show you. The first thing I have is a patch from Kernersville, North Carolina Fire Department. Also in that package is Forbush Station 11 patch. We also got a challenge coin from this department. They were also kind enough to send us two shirts. We've got the pink cancer awareness t-shirts and also this gray t-shirt logo on the front and a pretty cool logo on the back as well. The next two patches come from Dortmund, Germany. Here's a look at the first patch and some information to go along with it. It's a city with more than 600,000 people, but only nine full-time firehouses. This particular patch and the next one that I'll show you comes from their station one, which has 28 firefighters always on duty every day, staffing two engines one ladder, one battalion chief, one rescue, one crane, one tower, three ambulances, and a doctor unit. That's a lot of apparatus, and I'm sure that's an amazing station and fleet to see. This is the second patch that came with that. Thank you so much for these. It's exciting to add another couple German patches to the wall. The next patch comes to us from a place a little closer than Germany. This is from Redfield Fire Department in South Dakota. The next patch and logo come to us from a U.S. Army firefighter who is stationed in Ansbach, Germany in Bavaria. Here's the patch and also a decal. Thank you to the viewers that we have literally all over the world watching our videos. We couldn't do all of this without your support and we welcome you to leave your feedback, comments, questions, suggestions for future videos down below. Give us a like and if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do so. We hope you're staying happy and safe and healthy wherever you are and we'll see you next time.